main argument uh, is uh, to bring scientific excellence to, to the project, not to miss out uh, on, on your research, uh, part, a very relevant part of uh, the findings you can, you can bring. And also um, the fact that funding agencies and also magazines are requesting more and more uh, to integrate these aspects into the research in order to be funded uh, the project or to be published the, the results. Um, you went through the, some uh, methods uh, that uh, you have developed and that are available in the um, website that you have developed with uh, on gendered innovations. And uh, I think that the main purpose here is to discuss on uh, your research, uh, maybe how this, uh, the, the morning session uh, is inspired you and, and ask them mainly uh, how um, they can uh, give you ideas on how to bring this uh, uh, topic or this aspect uh, to your research. Maybe we should hear more about what people are doing their yes. research on if you're doing this research. So, so I, I was very intrigued by, by the, the, your uh, uh, explanation of the Google algorithms because um, uh, and, and the, whether we should, in a sense, look at what the situation is now, what has it has been, and, and uh, or, 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 or for the future, because uh, when text corpora became available, I, I way back made a study of, of uh, monolingual dictionaries of, of, of English, uh, the, one of them. So the, what sort of ex example material used from the corpora, just from the gender perspective? And and uh, could see that, um, of course, they, what they, the lexicographers chose was, um, was uh, in a, a, well, they had a number of appearances of a certain use that was very good as an example in a monolingual dic dictionary. But when you looked at it, it was always Tom killed Mary, not Mary killed Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you looked at the distribution well, of... Well, no certain, one should be killing anyone. No, no. <laughs> but, but you have to explain Tom the word kill. Mary. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to explain what kill means yeah, yeah. in those contexts. So the, it was biased when you looked at and, and the so women household affairs. And of course, it was based on the corpora and, and the frequency of appearances. So, but how can you predict the future? If, if, you know, <laughs> the future, what sort of algorithms would you like to have? Because well, it's not so. It's not predicting the future. It's choosing the future. True. Right. So the the Google Translate works on. It's the entire English corpora. Yeah. Right. Corpus. So it's all English language online. Um, so there wasn't any choice in that. But I think the. I think the big question for this whole area is we humans need to decide what we want for our future, right? And then create that. So we now, we know how algorithms work. Machine learning, uh, the machines sometimes take over and it's black boxed and you don't really know what's going on, but surely we can set it up in a way that, uh, you know, works in the end. So I think it's a matter of choosing the future. I was very uh, heartened two weeks ago, the computer science department at Stanford, which is our largest major now, <laughs> I don't know, they have so many students, um, they sent a delegation of four people to the Humanities Center to ask how to incorporate social issues into their core curriculum. And I was very pleased. Um, we're now having also a follow-up meeting. So I think that we, that the engineers and the technologists will also begin to understand these issues. It's getting big press in the United States, these issues of bias in algorithms. And so people become aware, and I think we understand that now it's a choice, that it's not just value neutral and it's not just objective if you set it in motion. We are going to, we'll have, a, we'll have a case study in a few months. It will be up. As I said, we're having this workshop at Stanford. Uh, 
it's a closed by invitation only workshop because we're actually producing materials. Um, we're having that March 22nd and 23rd. And we will, I gave those four examples this morning of the bias that is found. Then we're collecting all of the solutions to correct this bias and to, you know, head it off before it's produced, actually. So, and what I don't know is if each individual example has a specific solution or if you can generalize solutions, the tools across areas. And I think since we have people from different areas of machine learning and also from the medical school and, and uh, humanities and stuff, I think we'll, we'll find out. So we want to highlight the solutions on the website. And we will also frame out the ethical questions. I don't know if, I mean, obviously we can't solve those, but we can at least say what the key questions are. Do we have computer scientists in the room? Uh -huh. Do you want to share your research? Uh, what is the research you are doing and maybe? Are you with the Human Brain, brain project? project? Yes, yes. and what, so are, what are you doing with them? them? What is the... With the brain itself, or... Well, research? I don't know. Daily work in the, yeah. in the brain project. So, are you asking from the tender perspective? Well, um, I guess we're wondering... I'm just kind of interested in what you're, you're doing, and do you think there are any gender aspects that are included in your work? Yeah, sure. In... in <clears throat> In the field of engineering, um, we are facing the situation that there is no women studying engineering. Ah, yeah. So you will find the most of the environments you will work and you will find they are lacking of women, which is... Um, um, you, you, you see, see there's something wrong with that, because um, the, the environment, the way you work, the way you collaborate, the way you interact with your colleagues is, is, is biased. It's not natural in the sense as it should be in the rest of the, of the um, society. So for me, it, um, it arises that the question of how you encourage women to, to study engineering. Because that is one of the, the key issues I think we got in this field. Right, exactly. So um, I, I'm, I'm with my recent postdoc who's now got his professorship in Denmark, that's what's supposed to happen. Um, we're developing another article and we want to point out that there are three different kinds of diversity. Diversity on the teams, so whether there are women and men nicely represented. Diversity in methodology, which is what we are sort of talking about here, um, does, and then there's diversity in questions asked. And I think the fact that you miss the diversity of perspectives on the research team in computer science and engineering, you may not be getting all the questions, important areas of research that could be followed up. Um, and it's not that women necessarily, you know, it's not like new experiences on the X chromosome, the XX chromosome, right? It's just that we have different social experience. So, Iniki and I developed the Gendered Innovations Project because everybody can learn the diversity of methodology. So in your daily work with the Human Brain Project, I was wondering in the kinds of things you research, are there different, do you uh, look at sex and gender analysis as a variable or a factor in your work? Would it be relevant? Um, I'd just be curious to know if it's relevant in, in what you're doing. Specifically, in my, in my field and what I do, what I, I'm doing visualization. Visualization, uh, yeah. In, in my uh, field... Is that is how people, how, the, how eyes work, how people visualize things, or no, visualizations of, okay, I'm going to show you... visualization of data. It's right, helping right. people to understand data. Yeah, and yeah, okay from another perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in my field, there is no gender specific uh, issues or, 
or aspects, but from data. I mean, if data con contains gender, you can right. somehow map something and show something different, but, but there is, uh, in my specific daily work, there is no gender uh, mm -hmm. key aspects. But the ones I mentioned you, the, the, the social thing. Yes the social, yes, the social thing and data collection would certainly be an issue. Yeah. And then... Um, but specifically, in my, in my domain, there is no gender. Visualization. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have to think about that. Do we think there's any gender in visualization? <laughs> I don't All know. people interpret figures, <laughs> graphics? Yeah. I do, I know, I do know that um, people have studied how different cultures, and apparently sometimes men and women, read things on websites differently. So Chinese, how do the Chinese, I, I just read this, but I can't remember. So. In, in English, you quickly you can quickly move through things, but I think Chinese, it's a little slower in the, in the progression of how they look at things. So it would be really interesting in your visualizations if they work cross-culturally. I mean, maybe you're only doing Europe and maybe all Europeans kind of in, understand the same visualizations in the same way, but I, I don't know otherwise for visualizing data. Did you? Did you no, have an no, instance? I'm sorry, uh, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> watch you looking, you were watching me. Um, no, but I think uh, if you would ask the philosophers and uh, people uh, mm. who, um, uh, who maybe have studied um, uh, the way you ask questions or the way you frame questions, um, that, um, well, it's my gut feeling that there are um, uh, that, that you cannot uh, exclude any influence of gender norms on these issues. Uh, and who would be the best experts to, to help you to start this, to start this thinking? Um, uh, I, I wouldn't know, but um, uh, there, there's Could a be lot of a scholarship, uh, a gender scholarship on representation, representation in text and, and in graphics. So uh, I think if you, I guess if you, would start a, a search on it, on visualization and gender, that you would come up with some hits. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Possibly. Could be interesting. For, from myself, I don't have any clue where to, to look for this. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually think about that and ask my, ask my people. <laughs> <laughs> you were also in computer science. Yes. Um, but I'm starting in the HBP group project, so I'm not working on it yet. <laughs> okay. But were you inspired by what you heard today, or yes, something, yes. okay, this is uh, whatever, somebody else's job, or it's relevant to what I'm going to do? Yeah, I, I think that um, today was really interested, and in, in general, not only in research, it's really important to look forward to gender equality, but yes, I found it particularly interesting, and probably it will be my future career, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Good. So I would have one question, uh, it's not my uh, research question related to my research question, but um, about brain because there is this biggest myth about our brain is that they are male or female, so a bit related to that. So, uh, so I have seen some kind of uh, experiments for kids that they they claim that the the men are more or male are more um, competitive than female. So, do you know uh, if this is really proved, or uh, <laughs> like, uh, is it from the environmental facts what would affect to it, or is it in our genes that? Well, it's certainly not in our genes, yes. because there are many societies where people are not competitive, and they're also human, right? So mm. it's not in our genes. Um, I'm a historian, and I take the long, <laughs> long point of view on this. 
So we, we understand that men in our society are expected to be competitive, right? There are a lot of gender norms, a lot of expectations of people's behaviors. And men, for many, many years, were expected to earn the family income. Mm. And in order to do that, they had to be competitive. Mm. Then at the same time, women were supposed to be taking care of children. And you can hardly be competitive if you're taking care of a child, right? Mm. That's not an environment where you can be, com mm. if you're competitive, you're very, very ill. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so it's. I would say that probably men in our Western societies need to be competitive because that's part of the qualities for leadership and for success. And at the same time, so I'm very competitive because, and I have been successful in a very male domain, right? The field of history was all men when I studied in graduate school. It's very, academics is very competitive. So one learns the skills that one needs to succeed in whatever the domain is. If men wanted to take care of children, they would, they would need to learn those skills. So co being competitive is a skill that you learn that you acquire. And I'm, I'm sure that research, we just did some research, men are still somewhat more competitive than women, but it's, it's certainly not a human characteristic, it's a characteristic of our different societies. And then, of course, if women are, there's a lot of scholarship on women in leadership. And you may have noticed that the United States is never able to elect a woman president. Mm -hmm. And I call this the Hillary syndrome because mm -hmm. women leaders are supposed to be assertive and take the room and take the floor, mm -hmm. but women are not. So when she demonstrated her leadership capacities, she suddenly became some nasty words that I won't say publicly, right? Mm -hmm. So she was not then an appropriate woman. Mm -hmm. And so we have these, these conflicts. And then I know when, when men, sometimes men are primary school teachers in the United States, mm -hmm. people have all sorts of questions about these men. Are they sexual predators? What's wrong with these men, you know? So we have these domains in society, mm -hmm. and we have certain gender expectations, and these are the kinds of things that need to change, mm -hmm. right? Yes. That, that we can, people can assume the qualities they would like to have and not have expectations such that you fail when mm -hmm. you assume those qualities. Mm, yeah, I, I agree because I have been doing myself team sport and I see that we are kind of competitive, of course. <laughs> so right. I, I can understand that woman is also competitive and also in science you need to be to be successful. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, mm. But I was uh, surprised of this study. <laughs> well, yeah. I think sociologically you would find... It, so mm. we, we did... Um, we're, as I said earlier this morning, we're developing... Uh, these uh, patient questionnaires so that we can measure gender in mm -hmm. for clinical trials and stuff. And one of our categories was competitive. Are you mm -hmm. competitive? And we did we tested our instrument in two populations of two thousand each. And the men are are the men say that this is all self-reported, so you can't believe anybody, right? So the men conceive themselves still as more competitive, and the women do not say on a survey. Mm. It's all anonymous, but so there are either, there's either different behavior or different reporting of behavior or different expectations. Mm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I work in basic research. I work with Javier. And we study Javier de Felipe. You study what? With Javier de Felipe. Yeah. So we study the microanatomy of the brain. Microanatomy. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I always work with uh, males, uh, with a rat or mouse or whatever. Yeah, for HBP, we work with uh, mice of two months old, and, and they are males. Um, yeah, I think, as you suggested this morning, it will be very interesting to do a spe uh, an open call or something 
to specifically study uh, sex or gender differences in the brain, um, at least in my field, that is the microanatomy, I think is very important. Also, on the other hand, I study the effect of uh, drugs in the, in the microanatomy, uh, for example, the cocaine. And I always work in all the projects that are, are participated uh, with males, with animals that are males. And, and I don't know, I think it's, it would be interesting to, to, to do studies also in females, uh, because also in the human case, I think uh, we are le uh, less prone to addiction. And I think it would be very interesting to understand specifically differences in the uh, synaptic circuits or whatever that maybe uh, are explaining these differences in the tendency to the addiction. Or, and also because at some point, if we want to understand how the brain is working and everything, um, normally all drugs on, are tested in normally in males. And then maybe when you reach the, the, this testing part uh, in women, the drugs are working differently or unexpectedly, uh, in an unexpected way or something. Did you want to take that, Nikki? No, I, I couldn't properly hear you. Oh, ah, question. right, no. No, okay. maybe it was not just a specific well, question, that but that, I don't know, that as you know that. They use male animals. Yeah. They're studying yeah. addiction, cocaine addiction, yeah. and they use males also um, for in the Human Brain Project. So, I mean, the point you made this morning that you can't mm -hmm. study something in males and then generalize to females. Yeah, I see. I understand maybe we have to go step by step. And by the moment we are working with animals that are males, two months old, the, the mice. Uh, but at some point, uh, since we are uh, going forward in the, in the project, it, it would be very interesting to, to study in deep uh, the female uh, Mice also. Yeah, you, you really have to use both animals. You really cannot do a study in males and then just generalize it to yeah. females. This was almost the first principle that was developed in gender medicine, right? And this is so well accepted now. Already in 1993, the U.S. put into law that uh, clinical trials couldn't be done just on men and then you just think the drug works for women. So um, that's a long time ago. And even though our, our, our rule now, our regulation for including male and female mice is new, but um, the evidence is there that you really cannot assume that these two work the same. On the other hand, you don't want to assume always that you're going to find gender difference. This is the mm -hmm. research question, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to, you must test and I said gender, I mean sex differences. You, you must test for sex differences, and if you don't find them, you must publish that. Journals now um, in the US publish negative results because we're finding, okay, if we only publish positive results on sex differences, then you think they're everywhere, and maybe they're not. So people wanna start keeping a directory of where we've found important sex differences or not. But in the US now, and probably also, it must be in Europe, yeah. I think, um, people register, this is for medicine, and I would think it would apply to your area as well. People mm -hmm. register uh, a trial for publication, any kind of experiment for publication in the medical area. And then it is already, ex it's accepted for publication, which ensures that even negative results are published because somebody had an acceptable hypothesis, right? And then um, you, we must know the negative resu results as well. So I think for your ongoing work, um, you shouldn't—it's not—you um, shouldn't have to, to throw it away uh, as as long as you in your reporting precisely say that this was studied in many yeah, rats. Yeah. And I know from among a neuroscientist that this was, uh, is starting to become a, a regular thing. But the first researchers who had on their posters <laughs> this was studied in male rats, mm -hmm. and their colleagues asked them, why are you writing this uh, in male rats? So what was standard practice uh, all of a sudden became questioned. And well, that's the first step you can take. And yeah. the other thing then applies.
-hmm. Yeah, and you need to get it in the title. If it's only male rats, you need to get it in the title because people are going to be doing these algorithms and, and textual analysis, yeah. right? And you need to get it in the title, and if not, in the abstract. It has to be right up there yeah, yeah. so that we can find it. Mm. Yes. We are adding information. Yeah, step by step. but best to set the experiment up correctly with both animals and yeah. then see what's happening. Yeah. Thank you. I just would like to have a small yeah, question yeah. for you that uh, why, why did you choose the male rats at the beginning? <laughs> yeah, she didn't choose, somebody else chose. Oh, uh, it's standard oh, practice. There are, so there are all kinds of explanations given that yeah. if you use males, you can compare it to previous research. So if you start using then females, well, how can you compare it to previous research? And I also have been studying how women, real live women, fell out of medical research because I studied the 18th century and then it was always in any kind of medical experiment, you looked at age, because I think the two-month-old rat is also a problem, just constantly. Um, age and sex and something they called temperament, which meant um, what's your occupation and what's your kind of approach to the world. It was more of a social question. So you looked at those three things, and somewhere in the 19th century, the sex fell out, right? They continued with age. So it would be an interesting historical uh, investigation to find out how and why. I have three hypotheses, but shan't bore you with that. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I guess. Um, I have a question. Well, it's not a question, but going back to HPP, this morning Javier de Felipe suggested that maybe we could find, find some studies on gender, but I'm not sure if anybody in the HPP is willing to include females in the study, because the whole project is based on designing or studying one brain, so that's why we use two weeks um, all mouse, because we can integrate electrophysiological data with anatomical data. So if we now say, okay, we also need to include the gender or the sex variable, well, the whole project will fall apart. Well, better no now point. than in the future. <laughs> better do it now. Well, I, of course, I'm all about project, including it. I mean, it was not conceived correctly from the beginning. I, I, I agree. It's just, I mean, so better now than later. But how can we convince everybody to change it? Well, I don't, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, th there's so much evidence that you have, as I was saying this morning, you have to consider that there's not a male brain and a female brain, right? But you have to look at both sexes because in some instances there are different <clears throat> mechanisms um, and that sort of thing. And if you're only looking at males, you're only getting that part of the story. And females could either become very ill or die, or we don't understand the variety of human experience. It's completely intellectually corrupt and failing not to consider both sexes, that's like, that's like 101, right? It's like so basic. I, 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 are you sure that that's how it's set up? That can't possibly be true. What do you mean? That you, you use a male brain? Yeah, a sure. Male brain or yeah, yeah, we use just mouse brain to... With and small. only males? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> and they're all the Shall same. Shall I pretend I didn't hear that? I mean, that, that is just... That is. Well, there are many things studied in the HPP. Maybe. Well, of course, yeah. There are so many things. Like yeah. when the medical platform does something completely different. But mm -hmm. I am from the neuroanatomical part, so I can tell you. Which part? Neuroanatomy. Neuroanatomy. Okay. Yeah. So I can tell you that from basic neuroanatomy, what we use is this kind, is this model, and the, the data we generate is the one that is used later for for modeling the the brain. So the brain that is going to be modeled is but, going but to be... But why would, it, why would you use systematically male subjects if the hypothesis is that there's no sex differences, so you don't need to study females? Why wouldn't no, you no, just... No, no, that's not the hypothesis. Why would you not just mix the population? Because we agree that there are different brains. So, but you need to integrate all the data together, so you want to make it easier, so you need to have all the animals be as similar as possible. So you, so you just get away, like you don't use females because it's just noise that we would get in, in the study. Well, you know, I think we're smarter than that. We can understand complexity, right? 
Yeah, but so, that means that you have to do two experiments well, instead of more, one. Well, probably more than two, yeah, right? Or, or three or four or 20. Right, But right. you want to make it as easy as because possible. there's the young brain, there's the mature brain. I mean, the whole process of puberty and maturation mm -hmm. changes lots of things. And yeah, well. I don't say that, is, that I agree with this design, but it's just how it is. Okay. As part of the HPP. Okay. As part of news. the HPP, I mean. <laughs> uh, I have started my project before the HPP was set up. Yeah, but, so, but for the HPP, we just can use C57 mouse, two weeks old, male. This. And is there any arguments why this project was based on that specific male mouse brain? Is it the best of every mice, or? I don't know about the genetic background. I, I just know about the, the age, why we use that age, and why we use male, but I don't know if that, uh, how do you say, the species, I don't know if, if what's the reason for that. I guess it's the easiest mm, brain to study. It, vertebrate, I don't know. So uh, I was thinking about this, this thing you commented uh, previously about uh, com to be competitive. Um, and then you need to understand competitiveness as a skill you need to develop <clears throat> in order to compete and to reach the higher positions. So I was wondering if there is another uh, mechanism that has been already tested or tried that works better than com competitiveness and how we could move into that model um, if it's better. Um, because as, as you explained, you need as a woman to understand how to compete with men, with, with uh, who we are. We are uh, taught to to be competitive, so it's not a fair competition between genders. But also, I don't think competitiveness is is the key thing for doing things right. So because when you compete, you win, but somebody is losing. So I, I'm not really sure that that is. The best perspective to oh, address. Oh, I, I would agree 100 percent. Yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering, uh, and I wanted to ask if there's a, a specific or, or you got any clues or how how to change this model, and instead of compete, just cooperate, uh, which is the thing I, I, I will say that is more fair than compete. Particularly in research. Yeah. 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 Do you have, pardon me? Collaboration. <laughs> Collaboration, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just answering the question about competitiveness. I don't think it is a proper goal. So, but I think even when people collaborate, they compete as well. Groups compete as well. Um, there's obviously been many um, times in human history that we've tried to cooperate and I don't know, our market economy, just the way things are set up, one ends up competing. But it's not, because it's not part of us genetically or innately, we can choose to change it. And I would think it would be a better thing to do. So it's, it's not genetically uh, bound. Uh, it's something that we created on top of our society. It's something that our society, it's, it's the logic of our society in a way, right? For a couple hundred years. Okay. So we need a different social model. <laughs> I would think that would be nice. <laughs> but I, so for instance, I'm a historian and I think that I know that in my field, the whole way we become nicer to each other. So it used to be when you gave an academic paper, people would just try to tear it apart and they would just try to destroy you, demolish you, right? And that was thought that that was the best way to get good ideas, to be sharply critical was the best way to get good ideas. But uh, now there's been a, a change over the past 20 years, I would say, 15, 20 years, that people critique you by asking a question. It's much more gentle, and I think it's more cooperative in that sense, that we're more working toward 
what is the correct answer? Did you consider X, Y, or Z? Rather than saying, you didn't consider this, and I think that's terrible. It's more like, if you considered this, you might see this, or it might influence your outcome. So I, I, don't, I don't know how that change came about. One might speculate that a lot more women came into the profession, but that's not studied. That's just pure speculation on my part. Um, but we have had this change because um, some of my colleagues from economics came over and was listening to our history talks, and they said, oh, but you're so friendly to each other because they still have this, you know, destroy the presenter kind of ethic. So we certainly can change these things. It's, it's also uh, that, um, that you ask from reviewers or from your colleagues, not just uh, something like constructive critique. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to, to, well, to do away with, with all the data, but it's more difficult to come up with constructive uh, mm. critique to say, OK, this is uh, an uh, an outline uh, or give a view of maybe a better thing, and then you can have a discussion on that. Uh, is to, to go on from this, uh, just uh, like to be a bit pr provocative, I may uh, ask, should we stop talking about gender issues in, 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 in the sort of, uh, in the sense that we've done today here, because we've, we've seen the statistics, there, there are clearly too few women in, in, in the groups. That, that, that's a fact. But, but then, and because I've been involved in this, the female rectors uh, associations in different contexts, and we always seem to discuss the same issues. So, and, and, and the problem, if you look at the gender conferences, is that there's a clear minority of male mm. representation. So should, what, what, are we actually talking so much about gender, or is gender part of, work environment, work satisfaction, conditions, collaborative atmospheres, as, as we were talking about. What, what, what do you think? I mean, what would, how could we get to the next level and do something about it? So would that, would that be then a critique on how you label the issue as a gender issue? And would it be better if you label it as a working condition issue? Because I, I, th I think when we talk, when you see the word gender, and then, then Men tend to think it's not for me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and and, and, mm -hmm. and and sometimes they're very apprehensive. Present company excluded. <laughs> no, right. I'm, I'm absolutely. I'm, no, this is not blaming anybody. <laughs> but, but just how to get men involved in the yeah, discussion yeah. and women stopping from complaining only, because that tends to. I mean, I think it was very important for for female different female groups to discuss these issues and and talk to each other about their grievances but some I would like to get somewhere else with this and do do and and you use the information we have and and uh, because I think you proved in 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 in, in, in terms of science both female and 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 male animals are needed mm -hmm. whatever you do you can't generalize on the basis of one sex mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's one, um, there's one argument um, to interest men in sex and gender, in sex and gender issues in the medical field, and that is uh, where um, gendered behaviors uh, apply to both men and women. So there's, uh, of course, the whole movement was started from being women's issues neglected. But if you properly understand the influence of gender norms, and you come up with some examples where gendered behaviors or uh, behaviors directed by social gender norms to the detriment of a man's individual health, then you have a point in view there. And that, uh, so, I'm, I'm, in that particular field of medicine, I'm not inclined to stop talking about uh, uh, gender-related things. And, and, and I, I would maintain the word gender there. Yeah. I didn't mean that. I, yeah. I meant sort of this sort of general conference. Yeah. So yeah. we would get the discussion where we have both men and female re uh, right. representatives and, 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 and representatives and talking, you know, uh, talking on a, on a uh, sort of equal basis exactly. about, not about so much gender, but about 
collaboration and, and what good impacts teams have if they have both sexes represented and how it improves the research, which I think is, is a, the better side of competitiveness, if you right, want to put it right, that way. Right, yeah. right. Well, this is why um, I don't think that, so Javier this morning was suggesting there might be money to look at sex analysis in the research at the project. And this is why I said, well, you don't, you don't want to have a separate fund for that or something. As soon as you separate out sex or gender and make it a separate conference, then it's going to be mostly women, which is not correct, but that's what's going to happen. Um, so I think that the, this human brain project needs to strategize in ways that you would integrate the issues as issues of excellent research Right, and that that is a way to, to make sure your research comes out correctly um, and you don't separate it off into some other aspect. Like ethics is very often something separate and therefore it doesn't inform the research as it is designed. So we, we want all of these things integrated into the design of the research. So again, it, I come back to Stanford experience um, the computer scientists who came asking about how do we integrate social issues into our curriculum, they wanted to do a separate course. And I said, no, no, what you have to do is integrate it in all the classes that the students will take so that you have the, the famous computer scientist professor talking about these issues. And maybe they call on some of their colleagues who were experts in particular social issues, but they're the ones who have to show that they're important and guide the students in that. So it might, well, the European Union calls it mainstreaming, right? <laughs> it needs to be incorporated and not separated out. So, but we also call this the difference dilemma, and I think uh, this can apply to the gender dilemma. This was identified already in the 1990s, right? If you talk about gender and if you separate it out, you may even be reinforcing these stereotypes because you're talking about them. On the other hand, if you don't do anything about it, then everything goes on on an unconscious level. So I think we need to bring everything to the conscious level, but it needs to be in the core work. It shouldn't be separated out. And then the other thing that we do at Stanford is that the top management, the president and the provost of the university make it very clear that these are their values and then it becomes everybody's values. And they are kept alive. <laughs> yes, right. So, you know, if we have a search uh, for a new professor and if, um, say it's a department that has very few women and the search committee didn't find or interview any women, top management will just send it back, start over. I mean, you know, you ha it's not possible these days not to be able to locate excellent candidates. So there are many ways one can do it. But I appreciate, I appreciate the question because we had that problem today, right? Um, no leftover questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think uh, we can conclude here. The next session will start at 15:45. The closing remarks here. Oh well, that's that's so, in one minute. Yeah. Bio break. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much uh, mm -hmm. to the participants for your questions and yes. comments, and to Lorda Ineke for this great discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you.